Today I'm going to show you everything you need to know about creating for loops in VBA. By the end of this video, you'll be able to create any for loop you need in VBA, whether it's for ranges, collections, arrays, or something else. Make sure to download the 20 for loop examples from the description below the video. So let's go ahead and get started. If you like this video, then please click on the like button, and if you'd like to get notified of my upcoming videos, then click on the subscribe button and the bell icon beside it. So what is the for loop and why do we even need it? Imagine we want to print number one to the immediate window. We use the debug print value one to do this. When I click run, you can see it printed one to the immediate window. Let's print out the numbers one to five by copying this line four more times. Now when we run the code, you can see it printed out the numbers one to five to the immediate window. This is all very simple and straightforward so far. However, we have a major problem. Imagine we want to print out 1000 numbers or even 50,000 numbers. Obviously it's not feasible to write the debug print line 1000 times. Let's have a look at how the for loop solves this problem. We type for i equals one to five, and then we just need one debug print line. We use i for the number and we declare it before the loop using dim. So now the very same code, we run it and it prints out one to five. Now, if we decide we want to print out one to 100, we only need to make one simple change. Now, when we run it, it prints out 100 numbers to the immediate window. No matter how many times we want to print a number, we only need one debug print line. A second problem that for loop solves is flexibility. For example, imagine we want to print out the range of numbers based on user input. Without the for loop, we are stuck, but with the for loop, we can use a variable to decide how many times the loop will run. This time we create a for loop using the number from the user to set how many times it will run. When we run this code, VBA says, please enter number, and we enter the number 12. We click OK, and you can see that it printed out the numbers 1 to 12. Now if we run it again, and this time we entered number 7, you can see it prints out the numbers 1 to 7. So now you can see how flexible our code is by using a for loop. The for loop does two things. It saves us writing lines of code over and over, and it makes our code flexible. This is the format of a for loop. The first thing we need is a variable. It is standard practice that the for loop variable is always i. The next thing is the starting value. In most cases, this number is one, but in some scenarios, you may use another number. The end number is almost always a variable as it makes our code flexible, as we have seen. In this example, we'll use the number 10. The final thing is step, which you rarely need to use. So step one is the default, and this means use every number in the range. Step two means use every second number, and step three means use every third number. So for example, if we run the code, for i equals one to 10, step two, you will see that the result is one, three, five, and so on. The loop steps by two each time. Now in reality, we rarely use step like this. One way though that we might use step is to read through a loop in reverse. For example, if we wanted to read through rows or a collection in reverse order. In this case, we use step minus one. And when we use a negative number, we have to swap the start and the end numbers. So the end number must be less than the start number. Now when we run the code, you can see that it printed out the numbers in reverse. Now let's step through the for loop and see exactly how it works. I'm going to use the debug toolbar to step through the code. You can also use F8 as the shortcut. When we enter the loop, the value of i is zero. Now as soon as we step past the for line, i is set to one. I will have the value one until we reach the next i line in the loop. Now, when we step past the next line, a couple of things happen. First of all, next gets us the next number in the range, which in this case is the number two. And if that number is still within the valid range, then we go back to the first line in the loop, but i is now set to two. This time, when we go to the end of the loop, i is set to three, and we go back to the start of the loop again, and so on. But now it gets interesting. This time next will give us the value four. But because four is greater than three, which is the maximum value of our loop, we exit the loop automatically. So if you look in the locals window, you can see that i is now four. If you ever feel confused about how the for loop works, then step through it line by line just like this, and it will really help you understand it much better. 
Now we're going to look at nested loops. A nested loop is when we've got a loop within another loop. So why would we even need to do that? Well, let's have a look at the numbers here. So with these numbers here, we want to read through all the rows, but for each row of them, we want to read all the columns. So we want to read the value in each column. So if we go back to our code, you'll see at the moment what it does is, it just simply reads through all the rows and it prints out the first item. So we'll run this code, you can see we get 159, which is basically column one of each row. Now if we wanted to read everything in the column, what we would do is we create a second for loop. So we say j as long, let's make that j, and then we say for j equals one to range dot columns dot count. Now it's important that the for and the next of, of j must be inside the loop. So loops can't overlap. The, the loop must be fully contained inside the loop. So now if we do an i and a j here, and let's run this code to see what happens, and then we'll step through it so we can understand it completely. So we run the code, and you can see i is one in the first line, j is one, and the value is one. So then the next line, i is still one, j is two, and then the next one, i is one, j is three, and so on. So then you'll see that i becomes two, and you'll see j goes back and does one, two, three, four. And then you'll see i becomes three, and j does one, two, three, four. So once you get into how it works, it becomes quite clear. So let's step through this code, and we'll have a look at our locals window, so we can see the values as we step through it. So let's bring up the magnifier, so that we can see exactly what's, what our values are. So as we step through the code, i now becomes one, we're in the far i loop, so i becomes one, we go into the far j loop, and now j becomes one. So we print out the line, and then we're looking for the next j. So the next j is going to be two, and that's still within our range. And so this means we go back in, and now we've got i and j equals two. And then we say next j, j equals three, and then j equals four. So when j equals five, it, it goes out of that loop, and we're on to next i. So that works the same way. It simply says, give us the next i, which is two, and if it's valid, continue in the loop. So we're back at for j equals one, and what this will simply do is just reset this loop again and run through one to four again, with j being one, two, three, and four. And so this happens again, and then we go to for i, and of course this becomes three, and then j resets and one, two, three, four, and so on. So this is how a nested loop works in Excel VBA, and very useful for reading rows and columns, but if your nested loop is more than too deep, then it's worth kind of looking at your code and seeing should you design it a bit better. Sometimes we don't want to complete the for loop. If a condition is met, we may want to leave the for loop early. So how do we leave the for loop early? Well, what we do is we use exit for. So why would we use it? So if you look at the data that we have here, you can see what we're trying to do is find 90 as the ID. Now, as soon as we find 90 and do what we want to do, we no longer want to keep reading through the data. So we put an exit for afterwards. So let's put a breakpoint here, run the code. So you can see it stops here when we find 90, which is when i equals four. And then we step past that and we just simply exit the for loop. Because as I said, we don't want to waste time reading through data when we've already found what we're looking for. So you can see here i is four, but we've exited the for loop. Now we're going to look at reading through a collection. So as normal, we declare our variable dim i is long, and then we say for i equals one, two, and it's the collection name, and we use the count property. So this gives us the number of items in a collection. And then when we use debug print, we say the collection, and then we have parentheses and i, which is the current item in the collection. Now when we run this code, what you'll see is that it printed out all the items in our collection. Now, if we wanted to print out all the items in reverse in the collection, then we use step as I showed earlier. We do step minus one, and then we do from call count to one. So this is important that we start with the bigger number. Now, when we run the code, you see that it wrote mango, pear, apple, writing out the items in reverse. Now, one thing about using for i with a collection is that it's quite slow. So if you're dealing with a lot of data in a collection, you should always use for each. So the way we use for each is we declare the item as a variant, and then we say for each fruit in our collection. And then we just use the fruit variable to access the item. So now when we run this code, it will print out all the items in the normal order. 
So for each, very important if you're dealing with a lot of data because it's much faster than for i. Now we're going to look at reading through a one-dimensional array. So we use for i equals 1, 2, and we use u-bound. So what u-bound does is it gives us back the position of the last item in the array. So we say for i equals 1 to u-bound. And 1 is basically the first dimension. If we have a two-dimensional array, 2 would mean the second dimension. So now when we do debug print, we simply use i on fruit. And when we run this code, you'll see that it printed out everything as we expected. Now the one problem here is that arrays don't always start at 1 or 0. They can start at different numbers. So instead of saying for 1, 2, what we say is for L bound. And L bound will always give us the first position of the array. Now if we run the array here, as you can see we've set it to 0. If we run the array here, it actually misses out Apple because we have 1 in the position. So what we do instead is we say L bound fruit and that gives us the first position. And no matter what way the array is set, when we run the code, it will print out all the items. The first two lines of code here, they read a range of data into a two-dimensional array. And so what we're going to do is read through the two-dimensional array. You can see the data on the screen that we're reading. And then we're going to view the locals window so we can see exactly what our two-dimensional array looks like. If we open the first one, we click on the plus, you can see ID and data, which is the header. And the second one is 75 in Apple, 54 in Orange, and so on. So let's put all this data into a two-dimensional array. And we're going to read through the two-dimensional array. So how we do that is very similar to how we used the nested loop earlier. We declare j as the variable. And then what we'll do is we'll just simply copy this line. And instead of having fruit 1 in L bound and U bound, we put fruit 2. And what this means is that instead of giving us the lowest and the highest index of the rows, it gives us the low and highest index of the columns of our array. And then we put i and j in fruit. Then when we run the code, you can see all the data from the two-dimensional array in our immediate window. To learn more about for loops, make sure to check out my videos on for loops and collections. And remember, you can also download the source code for this video that has 20 for loop examples. If you like this video, then please click on the like button. And if you'd like to get notified of my upcoming videos, then click on the subscribe button and the bell icon beside it.